On January 5, 2002, the Colorado Avalanche renewed their heated rivalry with the Detroit Red Wings. Little did either team know that this would be the beginning of the decline between one of the greatest and most heated rivalries in NHL history. It was a relatively uneventful game between the two teams. Martin Skula opened the scoring for the Avalanche, but his team would be unable to score again, and goals from Pavel Datsuk, Igor Larionov, and Brendan Shanahan would see the Red Wings to a 3-1 win. An important side note in the history of the rivalry allegedly happened after the game. Red Wings goaltender Dominic Hasek had a fairly slow night in net that night, only facing 14 shots. The story goes that Avalanche coach Bob Hartley had asked for a stick from Hasek to give to his son who was a big fan. To be fair to Hartley's son, it was hard to not be a fan of Hasek, who was widely regarded as one of the best goalies in the game and well known for his erratic goaltending style. Hasek obliged and gave Hartley a stick. Fast forward to the conference finals and game 6 with the Red Wings down 3 games to 2 and trying to stave off elimination. The Red Wings were up 2 to nothing off of goals by Shanahan and Darren McCarty when Hartley called referee Kerry Fraser over to ask for a stick measurement on Hasek. Colorado was already on the power play thanks to a McCarty slashing penalty 30 seconds prior. Hartley suspected that Hasek was playing with a stick that had a blade that was longer than permitted, the three and a half inches regulated from heel to toe. Hasek's stick was brought over to the scorer's box and it was found that it was within the allowed specifications for a stick, given back to the goaltender and the avalanche were handed a two minute penalty. Why Hartley decided to attempt this call is clear. He wanted to provide his team with an extra long power play and at an increased advantage. And holding on to this information of an illegal stick is a brilliant use of a piece of specific knowledge in a highly strategic way. But his information was wrong. Where Hartley got this information on the potential of an illegal stick is shared among a few theories. Some say that the training staff of the Avalanche were caught measuring the stick in the hallway at intermission and Hasek was able to switch out for a legal stick in time. Others believe that it was well known information. Some even draw attention to Hasek's stick as a gift to Hartley's son earlier that year as the intentional planting of false evidence by Hasek. Hasek's comments later gave some credence to this when he said, He asked me for a stick for his son, so I gave him a stick. It came from the factory. It might be one millimeter illegal. Aside from being one of the most interesting side stories in one of the greatest hockey rivalries of the pro sports era, our attention is drawn to the often dismissed but wildly important aspect of the game, the stick. The hockey stick is one of the most iconic symbols of the sport. It has massive cultural implications both in wider society and within the game itself. And much like the rest of the game, as the sport moved from recreational to professional, standards were put in place to monitor and restrict the form and use of the hockey stick. Yet like every competition, there continued to be creativity and innovation applied to the hockey stick to continue to improve the quality of player and game that was produced. Somewhere in the Venn diagram of creativity, competition, and innovation, there is a crossover where people cross into attempting to gain an advantage in an unfair manner. Simply put, it invites cheating. The NHL has had numerous occasions of players using illegal sticks and many of them don't serve as any more than a minor blip in the penalty call of most game sheets. What we can learn is how players and coaches use information to gain a competitive advantage while at the same time how widespread the modification of hockey sticks is among players in the league. With the end goal of each game being to win, stick modification has led to iconic moments in NHL history while at the same time found its way into the normal everyday operations of being a professional hockey player. Hi, I'm Travis Duncan and I wanted to say hi to Mark Zuckerberg really quickly. I know you're listening Mark. Wash your hands, Mark. Hi, Mark. And this is Storytime Hockey. The importance of the hockey stick to the sport of hockey is apparent, but it's important that we show some appreciation to the level of influence that the hockey stick has had on the sport. The name hockey likely comes from an older French word, hockey referring to a stick or a shepherd's crook, or the English term hooky for a curved and bent stick. In the 1800s, as hockey began to rise in popularity in Canada, the first hockey sticks began to be made. Their development into the shape and form first used is credited to the Mi'kmaq First Nations people of Nova Scotia, Canada. Late in the century, they began to be manufactured on a larger scale, handcrafted from solid wood. 
elm and ash trees were the preferred source of wood for the players. However, from the 1930s onward, elm became very scarce, as a shipment of elm logs from France to Canada brought a beetle to Canadian shores, a beetle that carried the Dutch elm disease with them. By 1960, 80% of the elm stock in Canada had been killed. Then in the 1940s, one of the largest innovations took place. Instead of a solid one-piece stick being hand-carved, thinner layers of wood would be glued together and then laminated. This was a major technological advancement because it allowed more flex in the stick, leading to an increase in velocity in player shots, as well as the ability to lift the puck more frequently. At this point, however, hockey still remained a game where goals were scored on the bottom half of the net, a side effect of the stand-up style of goaltending play. As shot velocity increased, players were able to score more goals, but at the same time, goaltenders were open to a whole new level of danger in their position. There's a correlation, either causational or coincidental, to the technological advancements made in hockey sticks and the use of goaltender-specific facial protection. Perhaps the greatest moment of innovation and creativity in hockey came in 1963, and following the lead of many other innovations, was an accidental discovery. Stan Mikita was in his own way a trailblazer and innovator in hockey. Still the all-time leader in games played, assists, and points for the Blackhawks, Mikita was a small hockey player, both by the standards of our time and his. Mikita stood only 5'9" and during a game against the Maple Leafs was hit across the head by the stick of defenseman Kent Douglas. He got together with the engineers from Riddell, a well-known manufacturer of football equipment, and had them begin early designs on a helmet for players. Makita became one of the early adopters of wearing a helmet full-time. The original story of the curve of the hockey stick varies slightly depending on which resource you consult. Bobby Hull, Makita's line mate and potentially the biggest benefactor from Makita's innovation, says it was out of anger that Makita found out how to curve a stick. Others say it was a defective stick, and these tales line up with some of the additional details that outline both Makita's temperament when things didn't go his way on the ice, as well as his particularities when it came to hockey sticks. I am inclined to believe Makita's recollection of events. The Blackhawks had to climb a set of stairs to get to the ice surface from their dressing rooms at the Chicago Stadium. On the way to the ice, Makita says that he was bumped into while climbing onto the ice surface. In the process, he jammed the toe of his stick into a space between the bench door and the boards where the hinges are. The stick cracked, but it did not break. The combination of his temper, particularity about his stick, and the fact that his other sticks were not nearby, and also down a flight of stairs, Makita needed to let out some anger before he went to go get his new stick. He went onto the ice and saw a puck sitting not too far from the boards, and he leaned into a slap shot. His first realization that something was different was the sound the puck made when it hit the boards. He took some more shots and realized that something was different about the wrist shot as well. It was harder, it was more precise. Eventually, the stick did break, but now he was on to something. He intentionally tried to bend the stick, eventually figuring out that he needed to heat it up to bend it to his own preferences. Bobby Hull eventually asked for one as well. At the time, there was no real rule or regulation governing the amount of curve of a hockey stick. Since before this, there was never really a need for one. The banana blade, as it became known, propelled Makita and Hull to new offensive levels, although the team would not win the Stanley Cup again following their 1961 championship until the 2009 and 2010 year. As notoriety of the stick grew, others began to claim that they had invented the curvature of the blade. Andy Bathgate, a New York Rangers all-time great, perhaps has the best and most interesting claim to the title. Bathgate alleges that the curving of the stick was a common practice in junior hockey. Players would soak the blade in water to soften it and then bend it to their preferred curve. Once he reached the NHL, his coaches claimed that it was cheating and forced him to stop. It's common knowledge that hockey and hockey coaches are not the most flexible of individuals in the world, and hockey purism has been both a blessing and a curse in hockey for as long as the organization of this sport has been around. Bathgate, of course, complied with his coaches' requests. Bathgate says that he continued to sneak in a curved stick into the games, and in one game he had to lend a stick to Makita. Bathgate claims that is where Makita got the idea. Makita often was asked about this and denied it, making sure to point out that it took Bathgate years after his retirement to come forward with his claims. The only other semi-reputable claim to the innovation was Montreal Burt Olmsted, who portrayed a very similar story to Bathgate's that he had been using it when he was younger and had to hide it from his coaches. From there, the NHL had to intervene to manage the curvature of sticks. In 1967, 
The NHL was going through a multitude of changes both when it comes to rules and the introduction of six new franchises. The league introduced a new rule, regulating the curve to be less than one and a half inches on the blade of the stick. The curvature of the stick is measured by applying a straight edge along the stick that connects the toe to the heel. The difference between the blade of the stick and the largest gap with the straight edge from the face of the blade is where the measurement would be made. The NHL would continue to manage the curvature of stick blades limiting the curve to a single inch in the 1969-1970 season, and then again in the 70-71 season, limiting it to a half inch. The biggest change to the rule came with the change of enforcing it, when the illegal stick measurement penalty was introduced in the 1977-1978 year. The physics of the hockey stick and the shot became increasingly important as hockey continued to move on with small adjustments. The personal curves allowed players to cradle pucks, take backhands, and even introduced a new shot in the hockey world, the snapshot. The curve grabs the puck as a player shoots, making it easier to lift the puck and reach higher targets in the net. It was the ability to call a penalty on the curve that really provides hockey fans with quality and memorable moments. And in looking at these moments, we can gain an understanding of the role that the curved hockey stick plays in today's game. Consider for example Yarmer Yager. Yager broke into the NHL with the Pittsburgh Penguins, and he was traded to the Washington Capitals. Yager ended up traded again to the New York Rangers the year prior to the 2004-2005 lockout. Returning from the lockout, Yager exploded for one of the most offensively dominant seasons with the Rangers. The league was adjusting to a new set of rules, and there was emphasis placed on skill and speed. And while not the fastest skater that the league had ever seen, Yager's skills were never at question. He recorded 54 goals and 69 assists for 123 points that season, two points behind MVP and mid-season trade victim Joe Thornton. On March 8, 2006, the Rangers were facing the Atlanta Thrashers in a regular season contest. Yager had scored earlier in the first period his 43rd of the season. Tied at 1 and headed to overtime, coach Bob Hartley asked the referees to check Yager's stick for an illegal curve. With 1 minute and 48 seconds passed in the overtime frame, Yager's curve was deemed illegal and the Thrashers would go on to the power play. The power play was unsuccessful and the game would move on to a shootout. Following the Olympic break that season, the NHL had added an additional rule to monitor the curvature of sticks in the league. Referees would check stick curvature before the shootout to guarantee that players were playing with legal sticks. This stemmed from the idea that the game-determining breakaway competition would likely see an increase in deking as well as higher shots against goaltenders and the integrity of winning a point needed to be protected. Again, prior to the shootout, it would be determined that Yager was playing with an illegal stick, rendering him ineligible for the shootout. In the fourth round of the shootout, Marion Hossa would beat Henrik Lundqvist and the Thrashers would take the win. Rangers teammate Martin Ruchinski was incensed after the game, quoted as saying, On one side, the league wants more goals. On the other side, they don't let guys like Yogs play with the curve he wants. Yager was of course upset by all this as well, and he told the press that it was not illegal. He said, It was not illegal, I know that they are going to measure. Why would I go out with an illegal stick? It depends on how you measure it. You have to measure it from the bottom of the stick. If the referee doesn't do it, what are you going to do? It's also worth noting here that during the 2006 Olympics, Yager would have been permitted to play with a curve larger than the NHL allowed as the International Ice Hockey Federation had different rules. From Yager's comments, it is interesting that he points out that if he knew they were going to check, he would not have taken an illegal stick, therefore why would his stick be illegal? And to fully understand why he says it like this, we can take a look back to the 1993 Pittsburgh Penguins. On December 4th, 1993, Yager had recorded three assists in a game versus the Hartford Whalers. With the game tied at six headed to overtime, Hartford head coach Pierre Maguire called for an illegal stick measurement against Yager with only five seconds left in the game. Maguire had coached Yager previously as the assistant coach of the Penguins and later noted that Yager played with an illegal stick about 90% of the time. Again, Yager was caught playing with an illegal stick and he served a two-minute penalty. This brings up a strange aspect of the illegal curves in hockey, and it is worth discussing. Maguire gained this information as a coach of Yager. He played the role of an advisor, a mentor, and a confidant to this player. Then when switching teams, Maguire now held a different role, the adversary. In professional sports, people will do anything to win. Winning is attached to financial incentives, job security, personal relationships, or vendettas and legacies. 
When McGuire made the illegal stick call, he was coaching against the team he formerly worked for and against players and coaches that he knew. Earlier in the game, tensions rose as a fight broke out involving players such as Chris Pronger and Randy Cunnyworth, and the score was already at six goals for each team. Emotions were high, and McGuire had an obligation to his team as the coach to give them the best opportunity to win possible even if that meant breaking a trust with a player he previously and formerly coached. Unfortunately for Maguire, his team went without a single shot on net during the power play. Hockey has a funny way of naturally establishing poetic justice, and this was no exception, as Pittsburgh would go on to win the game on a goal by none other than Yarmar Yager. After the game, Yager was quoted as saying, It was the most important goal of my career because, hey, Maguire thought that he was the smartest guy after he called the thing. He thought the game was over that they were going to win. Coaches would use the tactic of using knowledge that they had about a specific player and their traits and would use it to their advantage when playing against them. Timu Solani was caught playing with a stick that was too wide, the distance from the bottom of the stick to the top, by Sharks coach Ron Wilson. Solani had played for Wilson when he was behind the bench in Anaheim and then again in San Jose. Upon Solani's return to Anaheim, Wilson knew that Solani played with the stick blade taller than fit specifications. He used this information to gain a penalty against the Ducks and eventually secure a win. Solani believes that it was a stick that he signed as a gift for Ron Wilson's 1000th NHL coached game that Wilson used to get the information on him. In 2008, during an NHL All-Star Game interview, then Ottawa Senator Jason Spezza discussed his stick preferences and how he curved his stick and then shaved the toe of the stick to be narrower. During a game of almost a full year later on March 9, 2009, Maple Leaf coach Ron Wilson called for a stick measurement on Spezza. With both teams out of serious playoff contention and his team down by a goal, Wilson wanted to use the piece of information that he had held onto for over a year to try and reward his team. Beza, picking up on what was happening, attempted to snap his stick and trade it for a new one on the bench, but referee Stéphane Auger grabbed the original stick and found out that the toe was too narrow to be considered legal and Spezza was assigned an illegal stick penalty. It becomes clear that there were two trends when it comes to illegal sticks. First, everyone plays with an illegal stick. Solani mentioned in interviews, the game after Wilson caught him, that players frequently played with illegal sticks, however would switch them out for legal ones in the third period so that if an illegal stick challenge is made, they would not be caught at an incredibly important point of the game. Secondly, the coaches who call for an illegal stick measurement are usually the same coaches. In our examples, we keep repeating the names Bob Hartley and Ron Wilson. Coaches who have the knowledge sometimes use it and sometimes do not. It all depends on how the coaches handle competition and strategically use the information that they have, while at the same time, being aware that calling out for an illegal stick measurement on the other team may result in the same being done to them, or perhaps would lead to a two minute delay of game penalty for not getting the call correct. We need to acknowledge as well the unspoken code that dictates many parts of hockey. Using this information gained on players and their stick preferences violates a player's unspoken rule of accepting it as part of the game. When your coach calls out a player on the opposing team, your coach infringes on the existence of that code. For example, Barry Trotz, while coaching with the Washington Capitals, served as an all-star game coach in 2016. He found himself on the wrong end of a few friendly taunts from Panthers all-star representative Yager. Trotz had caught Yager on an illegal stick infraction in all three of the previous years. The most famous of all illegal stick penalties, however, came in the 1993 NHL playoffs during the Stanley Cup Finals between the Montreal Canadiens and the LA Kings. Kings enforcer Marty McSorley was caught playing with an illegal curve in the final minutes of Game 2 with his team up 2-1. Led by coach Jacques Demare, the Canadiens followed seemingly accepted procedure for making an illegal curve measurement. It was known that McSorley played with an illegal curve. This information was held until it could be strategically deployed in the most effective way possible. And with McSorley in the box, the penalty killers on the Kings quickly found themselves unable to deal with the now encouraged Canadians. Eric Desjardins scored his second of the game to tie it at two and then would complete his hat trick in overtime. The Canadians would go on to win the Stanley Cup, riding the momentum from that game too. Guy Carboneau was on the 1993 Canadian squad and acknowledged that there were multiple players on each squad that had illegal sticks. However, it was also known that you changed your stick in the third to not get caught. It was easy to see that McSorley had not changed his. McSorley believes that it was more malicious than this and states that he has had players tell him that the Canadians measured the LA King's sticks during a break in play by pulling the stick rack into the Canadians room and measuring each individual stick. It doesn't really matter how the team knew, 
but the incident definitely goes down as the most historically significant illegal curve penalty in the NHL. Since then, illegal curves have become a less common penalty as a variety of other strange moments have taken over. Yevgeny Kuznetsov got caught playing with Nick Holden's stick after both players dropped theirs and Kuznetsov played the puck intentionally with the wrong stick. Vladimir Tarasenko was assigned a penalty for playing with Colton Pareko's stick in a game versus the Colorado Avalanche. A player can hand his stick off to another player intentionally, but however cannot pick up the stick that does not belong to him. At the same time, sticks have not stopped changing or developing. In 1999, the biggest innovation leap came out when the Easton Synergy Stick, the first fully composite stick, made its way to market. Considering that the most popular stick before this was 30% heavier, this was a massive jump in the quality of hockey stick. With the composite design, sticks would increase the power generated by the players in their shots. Since then, there have been innovations like the Reebok O Stick material changes with Kevlar sticks, and even sticks that have holes in the blade that have made their way into the league. What hasn't changed is the continued efforts of innovation and creativity in the league. As the skill of player in the league continues to grow, innovation continues to give players opportunities to change the game and improve the most iconic piece of equipment in the game. Players are likely to continue to try and get away with widespread cheating, unspokenly accepting that stick modifications are just a part of the game. Just don't forget to switch out your illegal stick when you're up by one goal in the third period of the Stanley Cup Finals. The next section of the podcast will focus on players who you may or may not have forgotten about. With no real rhyme or reason to the selection of these players, this portion of the podcast will be dedicated to the players that score occasionally, get traded for a second round pick, and sometimes even win an award. This is Storytime Hockey, the players you forgot about. One of the most unfortunate realities of the NHL is the fact that despite being fan favorites, celebrated athletes, or even local celebrities, NHL players are quite simply movable assets in a multi-billion dollar company. From the age of approximately 15 to 40, professional athletes are at the mercy of contract limits, salary caps, franchise long and short term goals, and other influences. To this end, players get traded all the time. The record for the most teams played for in a single season is four. UC Jokinen is the most recent, who through a series of trades and waiver claims played for the Vancouver Canucks, Columbus Blue Jackets, LA Kings, and the Edmonton Oilers over the 2017-2018 season. The first in 1977-1978 was Dennis O'Brien, who played six full seasons with his only franchise in the Minnesota North Stars before being traded to the Colorado Rockies, then to Cleveland, and then to the Boston Bruins to finish out the year. In between these two occurrences, we have Dave McIlwain, who in the 1991 and 1992 season joined Dennis O'Brien in the record books. McIlwain played with the Seaforth Centenaires for two years before moving to the Ontario Hockey League with the Kitchener Rangers, where he managed 34 points in 61 games. In 1985-1986, he would break out with the Rangers, recording 14 points in 13 games, before moving to the North Bay Centennials, where he would finish the season with another 58 points in 51 games. There was no better time for his breakout season as it was his draft year, and he would be selected 172nd overall in the ninth round of the 1986 draft by the Pittsburgh Penguins. The following year, he returned to North Bay for one of the franchise's most successful seasons. They won 46 of their 66 games. Michael Wayne himself put up a spectacular point total with 46 goals, 73 assists, for 119 points in 60 games. The Centennials would win their division that year and compete for the right to host the Memorial Cup, the national championship for junior hockey in Canada. At this point, the Ontario Hockey League organized a playdown between division champions to host the event. The league would host this playdown between the two teams during the league's first round playoff series where the division winners held buys in the first round. North Bay would lose in Game 7 to the Oshawa Generals and lost the right to host. The playoffs went on and in the finals, North Bay would advance to meet the Generals again, repeating their earlier series and the outcome was the same, losing in Game 7. The OHL determined that since Oshawa had won the right to host, as well as the OHL's berth in the Memorial Cup Championship, they would only allow Oshawa to compete, leading to the last ever Memorial Cup Championships fought for between the three teams. McElwain did his part to push the Centennials to the final, with 25 points in the 24 games played. 
During the year, McIlwain would also compete for the World Junior Championship with Canada held in Czechoslovakia. Alongside future NHL greats like Theo Fleury, Brendan Shanahan, and Pierre Turgeon, he recorded 8 points in 6 games and was involved in one of the most famous international hockey moments ever, a bench-clearing brawl versus the Soviet Union known as the Punch-Up in Piestiny. McIlwain would split the next year between the Pittsburgh Penguins of the NHL and the Muskogan Fury of the IHL. He was moved on June 17, 1989 from the Pittsburgh Penguins, along with Randy Cunningworth and Rick Tabaracci, to the Winnipeg Jets for Randy Gilhan, Jim Kite, and Andrew McBain. He played two years for the Jets as a serviceable NHLer and had his most productive year in 1989-1990 when he recorded 25 goals and 25 assists. This brings us to the focus of the story, the 1991 and 1992 season. McIlwain started the year out with the Winnipeg Jets, and after three games he was moved to the Buffalo Sabres. The Sabres acquired McIlwain, Gord Donnelly, and a fifth in exchange for Mike Hartman, Dean Kennedy, and Darren Shannon. He'd only played five games with the Sabres, as he was moved again on October 25th to the New York Islanders. McIlwain was moved in a blockbuster deal to the Islanders along with Benoit Hogue, Hugh Krupp, and Pierre Turgeon in exchange for Randy Hillier, Pat LaFontaine, Randy Wood, and a 1992 fourth round pick. Now on his third team in under a month, McIlwain would settle a bit and would be able to play 54 games where he would record 23 points. On March 10, 1992, his final move of the year would take place as he moved along with Ken Baumgartner to Toronto in exchange for Claude Loisel and Daniel Morois. That made four teams in under seven months. Being moved this frequently between cities and countries comes with its own background issues. When he moved from Winnipeg to Buffalo, he shipped a vehicle, but it was held up at customs at the Fort Erie border crossing because it did not pass US standards. His father had to sell it for him. He then leased a vehicle when he was moved to the Islanders, but was unable to take it with him across the border when he was traded to Toronto because it was a lease and he was not able to bring a leased vehicle from one country to another, leading to a financial buyout penalty on the vehicle. When he was traded to Buffalo, he signed a lease on a place to live, but then was traded the day after. Fortunately, thanks to the landlord, he was able to get out of the lease, but he had to store all his furniture in Buffalo for a year. He had multiple bank accounts across the country, and during all this management of life outside of hockey, he had to manage life inside of hockey as well. The reality was, that he needed to play well because if he didn't, he would likely be traded again or demoted to another location in the AHL. After his crazy year of being traded, he played one more year in Toronto during the 1993 season, which included a run in March of 11 wins, 3 losses, and 2 ties. He only played 4 games in the playoffs, but was with the team on their run to the conference final where they lost in Game 7 to the LA Kings, a series that saw the famous high-sticking incident between Wayne Gretzky and Doug Gilmore. He would join the Ottawa Senators that offseason and would be traded once more on March 1st, 1996, returning him to the Pittsburgh Penguins. He would spend the next season split between the International Hockey League and the NHL with the Cleveland Lumberjacks and the New York Islanders, but his NHL career would come to a close. In 1997, he moved to the Deutsche Eishockey Liga, the top-tier German hockey league, followed by two years in Switzerland before continuing his career in Germany from 2000 to 2009 when he called an end to his playing career. McIlwain certainly was a serviceable international and professional hockey player. His career is a great example of how a player can be moved frequently in a league that sometimes can treat its employees too much like assets. Fortunately, McIlwain took a good approach to the trades. He was quoted as focusing on the fact that teams wanted him, not the, facts that, not the fact that teams were trying to get rid of him. And even though it was difficult as a mental challenge to be moved around four teams in seven months, and to experience all the things that came along with that, McIlwain fortunately was able to have a long hockey career. He played over 500 NHL games and continued to play into his 40s. And despite not ever having set any goal scoring records in any of his leagues, he managed to work his way into a space in the record books that hopefully is never challenged again. Storytime Hockey is written and produced by me, Travis Duncan. No closing this week. I am going to listen and educate myself. This is a we problem. This is about human rights. We need to make the world a better place.